adaptation is an inherited trait that increases an organism's chance of surviving and reproducing in an environment. We're going to take a look at some very cool adaptations here. Can you see the rabbit? How many adaptations can you identify in this short uh, GIF or JIF, whichever you prefer? Uh, obviously, some pretty powerful legs for speed and really enormous ears. Do uh, you think that's just for hearing? Or there may be more to it than that. So, all species on Earth are uniquely adapted to their environments. Every species has many adaptations. Okay, so I have to read this whole paragraph to you, which could be kind of boring. However, you're supposed to be doing something. Um, if you have your book, which I know for sure a whole slew of you don't, but if you have your book, please open it, and here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read this paragraph, and you're supposed to circle an example of a structural adaptation, highlight an example of a behavioral adaptation, and underline an example of a functional adaptation. Okay, so let's go on through and see what happens. Every species has many adaptations. Scientists classify adaptations into three categories, structural, behavioral, and functional. Structural adaptations involve color, shape, and other physical characteristics. We're supposed to circle an example of a structural. So, there's the first structural, the shape of a tortoise neck, is a structural adaptation. Behavioral adaptations involve the way an organism behaves or acts. So the next thing we're supposed to do is highlight an example of a behavioral. Um, behavioral adaptations involve the way it hunts or acts. Hunting at night and moving in herds are examples of behavioral adaptations. So hunting at night and moving in herds, I've highlighted that. And then finally, I have to underline a functional adaptation. Functional adaptations involve internal body systems that affect biochemistry. A drop in body temperature during hibernation is an example of a functional adaptation. The figure below illustrates examples of all three types of adaptations in the desert jackrabbit. Except I'm not showing you the picture, I'm showing you, like I promised, a picture of a tortoise with a really, really long neck. Those guys can really stretch out those necks. Okay, so the last thing, do you know what to underline? Did you find it? Yeah, drop in body temperature during hibernation. Little exercises like this are really, really good for you because you might read this paragraph and remember nothing. This forces you to realize there's three key points here and gives you a way of marking them so that you can go back and find them easily. Reading the book, it's not just a good idea. All right, here's the picture of the three adaptations. Those ears are a functional adaptation. The blood vessels in the jackrabbit's ears expand to enable blood to cool before re-entering the body. You ever seen elephants? You know there's two main types, the Asian elephant and the African elephant. Do you know the difference? The African elephants have these huge ears. The Asian elephants have shorter ears. The African elephants live in a hotter climate, and we think those large ears are for two reasons. One, to help dissipate heat, and two, when they, they want to look even bigger. Like, why would an elephant want to look bigger? I don't know, but apparently they do, and they put those big old ears out, and you think this really monster elephant's coming after you. Okay, structural adaptation. The jackrabbit's powerful legs help it run fast to escape from predators. And behavioral adaptation, the jackrabbit stays still on the hottest part of the day to help conserve energy. Seems like good advice for those of us living in Florida in the summer. Okay, this I brought in some pictures to show you some other interesting adaptations. Can you see the snake in the picture? It isn't real easy. You can see how the coloration of the snake has helped it blend in with the leaf litter. Here, the caterpillar does have similar coloration to the leaf, but it also has these two big spots. Those aren't its eyes. Those spots are to look like big eyes to make a, another predator be afraid or fear going after this creature. 
And finally, this uh, pelican obviously has this classic adaptation of having its own kind of fishing net built in so that it can scoop up and swallow fish. And all of you have probably watched the pelicans swooping and dive bombing onto their prey and swallowing the fish. It's uh, pretty interesting. The white pelicans tend to be in the center part of the state, and the gray pelicans are what we see here on the coast. Ah, I really like sushi. Okay, camouflage, which we've just taken a look at, is an adaptation that enables a species to blend in with its environment. And we saw that clearly there. Mimicry is another really neat adaptation. The resemblance of one species to another species is mimicry. And I should have some good examples here. This is more of camouflage, and this little guy's trying to look like a snake instead of like a caterpillar. Uh, some predators would be less likely to tangle with a snake than a caterpillar. Although some caterpillars are pretty ferocious. Here's two butterflies. And if you just saw them go by quickly, you'd go, oh, that's a monarch. Well, the difference is, the, this is the monarch. The monarch butterfly has two rows of spots on the edges of its wing. And if you're a bird, you learn quickly that monarchs taste terrible. You don't want to eat a monarch. It's like nasty and kind of poisonous. And so the birds tend to leave monarchs alone. I'm not sure how the viceroy figured this out. But the Viceroy has very similar coloration to the monarch. The birds can't tell them apart, and a lot of people can't. And so the birds leave these guys alone, although as butterflies go, I haven't talked to a lot of birds about this, but they say they're delicious. Two snakes that live in Florida, the eastern coral snake, this one has a neurotoxin. Now it has small fangs, so it has to kind of get like between um, your fingers to actually give you a very dangerous bite. But if it gets that venom in you, you have a very short time to live. Its venom is similar to that of a cobra. This is the scarlet king snake. It's completely harmless and a very beneficial snake to have. At first, they look similar. But the coral snake, as far as I know, always has a black nose. And you can remember that it, red and yellow kills a fellow. Red and black put him back. Okay, so the red touching the black means they're safe, but the red touching the yellow means not safe. Those are two ways to tell the difference, but if you're out in the wild and you see either one, don't hurt them, but give them a wide berth and let them go on and do their thing. Have you seen these around? I don't know if you can, you can see that. These are pretty familiar around here. It kind of looks like a wasp, doesn't it? This is another form of mimicry, and it's not a wasp. It is a butterfly, or a moth. It's the oleander moth. All right, so that should get us back to normal. Um, and these eat a plant that grows, uh, a lot of people have them around, called oleanders. The oleander leaves are very poisonous and toxic. Don't put it in your salad. Uh, and so these guys have adapted somehow to eat those oleander leaves. And then if a bird eats them, the bird gets very sick or maybe even dies. It just looks like brown leaves, doesn't it? Do you see the lizard? There's the head, the eye, the body. There's a leg, there's a leg, there's a leg. And this thing that looks like a big light leaf is the tail. This ability to camouflage and mimic in the natural world is truly amazing. And uh, it's one of the reasons that I love watching nature documentaries, because you get to see things like this. All right, we've made it to selective breeding. The breeding of organisms for desired characteristics is called selective breeding. Like many domestic plants and animals produced from selected breeding, pigeons look different from their ancestors, as shown in the figure on the left. So, I guess pigeons used to look like this, now they look like that, and th through selective breeding, or maybe they started like this and we made them look like that. Uh, and we can continue to make these changes by crossbreeding for different characteristics. 
People do this with dogs all the time, and maybe even with cats. All right, that's the end of this section. But I bet I know what you're thinking. Mr. C, what about the concept map? Well, if you want to work on it now, great. If you want to pause the video and wait and then work on it, you can. But I'm going to tell you how to add this section to the concept map that you already built with 11.1. Ready? Oh, just kidding. We get to watch a video first. Hang on. Eruptions. In the cool waters of the South Pacific, eruptions of underwater volcanic vents millions of years ago gave birth to a cluster of islands. The volcanoes are still active today, adding new land to 13 major islands and a smattering of rocky outcrops. They lie 600 miles west of Ecuador, which oversees these islands called the Galapagos. It was here in the 1830s that Charles Darwin came as part of his five-year voyage aboard the HMS Beagle. His observations of the unique adaptations of its wildlife helped him devise his theory of evolution and natural selection. Some species here are found nowhere else. Marine iguanas, the only seafaring lizards in the world, blanket the rocky shores. After absorbing the sun's heat, they dive into the ocean to feed. They can hold their breath for 10 minutes at a time, steadily gorging themselves on algae. Small fish nibble in their wake. Large groups of sardines approach, followed by sea lions. Soon others join the hunt. Galapagos penguins, pelicans, and dolphins. This sea lion is probably more playful than hungry, but the marine iguana wants no part of the game. It retreats to shore, followed by its kin. Farther inland, a different kind of lizard roams. These land iguanas, like their marine relatives, most likely evolved from iguanas washed onto the shores of the Galapagos Islands several million years ago. Some of their descendants chose the sea. Others went upland. To reach adulthood, baby land iguanas must avoid the island's many predators. They are a favored food for snakes, and Galapagos hawks. Young iguanas are abandoned once they are hatched. Their mothers, though, go to surprising lengths when it is time to lay their eggs. Many make the journey up the side of the volcano. There, 4,000 feet above sea level, they incubate their eggs in the warm ash. Choice nesting areas are scarce and hotly contested. In time, a new generation of iguanas will be born. They will spread out across the island from their volcanic birthing grounds. The same volcanoes which helped give birth to the islands themselves, the remarkable Galapagos.